Hello, everyone. Welcome to week number four of our learning adventure. It seems like this class is going by very quickly, at least it is for me. I hope that you've been uh, learning and been able to glean from our discussions in the uh, discussion forums. I uh, want to continue to encourage everyone to bring in outside sources to the discussion. Uh, if all we're doing is regurgitating uh, what we're reading in the course text, we're really not adding to one another's learning. And you'll remember that uh, in the Bible, uh, Boaz allowed Ruth to glean in her fields. Well, all of us have a field that we're learning in, and we need to allow others to learn from our field. So bring in some of your reading from the outside uh, to your discussions. Make certain that you cite those sources and that you list those sources at the bottom as a reference so that others can look up those sources as well. Uh, this will only further and, and uh, enhance our learning together in the course. Um, we're going to today uh, look at a couple of different areas. We're going to finish up our discussion in regard to uh, the quasi uh, textbook and then move into the other textbook uh, regarding organizational development. So there's going to be kind of a shift. Uh, this week you're to read chapter 10 and 11 in your textbook. Anyway, uh, make sure you do that. I'm not going to really talk too much about chapter 11 because it's a review but it's a good summary of the entire book. And so uh, it gives you the opportunity to get information without having to go through the entire book once again. So uh, the chapter 10 talks about measuring change. And uh, we talked about this change process that we're in. And uh, along the line, we have to be able to measure whether or not this change is actually occurring. And so the authors give us some uh, context within which to concern ourselves with this measurement. And uh, some of the things that they tell us that we need to make sure that we're doing uh, to assure that the change process is moving along smoothly is number one, to avoid giving mixed messages. Uh, so in other words, as we're leading in this change, we wanna make sure that what we're saying and what we're doing are, uh, are uh, coer uh, not coercive, uh, are, uh, what's the word, that, that they are uh, equal, that we're saying the same thing that we're doing, and we're not sending mixed messages to the people that we're trying to lead. Also, we want to make sure that we're gathering uh, accurate data. If uh, people feel as though that they're going to be reprimanded for the information that they're giving, or if people are overcompensated for the uh, information that they're giving, they may fabricate uh, that type of information uh, for the data that you're using to measure the change. Now, in uh, a kingdom-oriented culture, we would hope that that would not be the case, but nevertheless, we have to make sure that we're building uh, trust with the people that we're leading so that they feel safe to provide accurate information, even if that information is negative. Um, I think that in our organizations, we need to have that safe culture that enables people to speak their mind, that enables them to say what they think and to provide accurate data, even if it might be negative, so that we can advance the organization. Uh, there are people that are always going to disagree with what we're doing or what we're trying to lead. And it's important that we enable them to speak and that we hear what they have to say, because what they have to say may be critical uh, to help us to bring about change. And it also gives us as leaders the opportunity to uh, help them to understand what we're trying to do. In my own church right now, uh, we just uh, brought a new couple on board as our youth pastors. Now, this couple was in our church. They were working in our church. They do not have credentials with any organization. However, they've had experience in youth ministry. They've served as youth pastors in other places. 
and uh, we had an opening. And rather than going and fishing outside of our organization, we hired from within. Well, one of the people in the organization thought it was wrong to call them youth pastors because pastors should be designated only for those people who have credentials. Well, that's kind of an antiquated way of thinking, but nevertheless, this is a perspective of this individual. And so it's my job to help them to come along and to see that in our culture, that credentials does not make one a pastor. Rather, the idea of a pastor is something that we hold in our heart, not on a piece of paper. So that's the ideal that's different from what this person is used to seeing and, and, uh, and being involved with. So I welcome that conversation and hopefully I'm able to uh, provide insight as to why we did what we did so that they can understand the change. So giving that freedom to express and to explain and to provide information without feeling as though they're going to be dumped on or um, something negative uh, is very important. Also, uh, they recommend that we keep our measures simple. The more complex we become, the harder it is to bring about change. So uh, you've heard the old cliche, K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid. Well, this is pretty much what we're talking about. Just keep it very simple. Uh, the measures that we're using to determine how progress is going should be very simple and should uh, be uh, understandable for the people that we're leading. Uh, then fourthly, uh, they discuss various control systems that we need to be aware of. The interactive controls, that is how does the organization uh, function within the environment, that is that environment locally and globally. How does it function? What are the boundary systems? We've talked about this in the past. You know, who has the authority to do what? What actions am I able to take? What are the belief systems? That's the third uh, control system. What are the values and the beliefs of the organization? What are the goals and the mission of that organization? And then diagnostic steering. That is the traditional management that's involved in the organization and the system and focusing on performance variables that exist. So these are different measures that we can use. And then they also talk to us about measuring or measurement models that we can use. And, and there are, uh, let's see, there are five, five, four of them, I'm sorry. Uh, the first one is strategic maps. And then the second one is the balance scorecard. Then we have the risk exposure calculator. And then we have the DICE or the DICE model. Uh, I'm not going to go through each one of those. I will leave that to you uh, to review them. However, I can tell you that the balance scorecard is a means that you can implement within your organization in order to determine you know, how you're moving and how you can measure not only organizational performance, but how the organization is conducting itself uh, during change. Now, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that the risk that we're taking in the change needs to be taken into consideration, and we need to evaluate that risk as to the outcome. Um, I guess the way I put it to folks is you need to determine which hill you're willing to die on. Not every change is a good change. Now, it may be a good change, but it may cause more difficulty than it brings about positive results. So it's always important that we are uh, in communication with everyone that's around us, that we are collaborating with other people, that we are creating buy-in so that we can initiate change within our organization in such a way that we are producing good fruit within the organization. So these are the various models and I encourage you to review each one of them. Some of them may work for your organization and some of them may not work, but that's what you as a scholar practitioner have to determine. 
being aware that these models exist is what is important for you because it probably is not going to be right now but down the road you're going to be uh, called upon to initiate some change and knowing that these models exist you can go back and refer to them having a basic knowledge is what's important right now then moving to the uh, new textbook that we're just getting into organizational development uh, the first chapter deals with theories and practices of organizational development and uh, we talked about some of these when we were together in South Lake we talked about systems theory this is the first and the basic theory if you will for organizational development uh, Ludwig von Bertalanti is the one who first came up with the concept he was a biologist and he recognized that within biology there were systems and then others came along and began to expand upon his theory and uh, you know I would encourage you to look for uh, von Bertalampi's book it's called general systems theory and it's uh, you can get it on Amazon as a used copy but it gives you a really good basic understanding for systems theory so uh, take a look at that. Then they talk about action research theory. Uh, we talked about action research. Uh, uh, Dr. Marco came in and he talked about research and action uh, research. And then specifically, he moved into appreciative inquiry. And these are both involved in organizational development. And the authors of our textbook say that action research, who uh, was basically developed by Kurt Lewin, uh, is the cornerstone of organizational development and many uh, scholars will point to Lowen and his work in uh, social uh, uh, construction uh, constructionism as being foundational for understanding organizational development so systems theory uh, action research and then social construction constructionism is the uh, third uh, theory then complexity and chaos theory this is another up-and-coming theory that's out there and really something that you need to understand Margaret Wheatley I mentioned her book when we were together has an outstanding book on management and uh, I don't see it right here on my bookshelf but uh, uh, it's in one of the, uh, it's, it's on the syllabus, and hers is another excellent book to read, especially with regard to chaos and complexity uh, theories. And then finally, dialogic organizational development theory. Uh, all of these theories serve foundational for an, a discussion of organizational development. So make sure you read the book carefully with regard to these things. Uh, because they will help you as you uh, further your endeavors with regard to organizational development, not only in this class, but also in your leadership. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have done as human beings is we have followed closely um, a linear ideal of how things function. But more and more we're seeing that complexity and chaos is part of that function uh, that everything is not always linear so understanding complexity and chaos theories is very very good so i encourage you to spend some time uh, reading this so uh, go through the textbook let me know if you have any questions uh, also uh, make sure that you're engaging in the discussion forums i i strongly urge you to be adding new learning to the discussion forums. Just something off the top of your head is really not what we're looking for. Uh, so do your very best. Uh, your next assignment is due on February the 17th. Uh, I sent out an email about that. Also, I sent out an email <coughs> with like seven things that everybody really needs to work on in their writing. <coughs> so please pay attention to that and put them into practice in the discussion forums. The discussion forums is a good place to practice those things. So I'm running out of time. God bless you all. I'll see you in the discussion forums.